Hello, comrades. Um, welcome to uh, the first session in our new series on revolution and counter revolution between 1914 and 1939. I think originally we called it in the 20th century, but maybe <laughs> Kevin got cold feet and it's too much, too much to cover, but that is probably the, the most uh, important history, which covers a lot of things, obviously the main things being the Russian revolution and Nazism, fascism, uh, etc. Uh, so I think the series, and thank you very much to, to Kevin for putting it together, is attempting to draw, um, you know, a chronological uh, logic there. Because you normally when you go to school, you get taught one thing, then you get taught another thing. They have nothing in common. There's, there's no, no relationship between them often, you know, between Nazism and the revolution or the Russian revolution. What's the connection there? lots <laughs> lots and lots and lots and i hope we're gonna it's one of the things i'm hoping um looking forward to drawing out in in, in this series um kevin bean is our first speaker but i understand there will be other speakers throughout the series so i'm um, very much looking forward to uh this session thank you kevin fire away okay thanks tina and uh you're quite right about the need to to link things uh, together and uh, that's what, what, what we're hoping to do with these, this series. There will be other comrades speaking. In fact, uh, I'll only be dealing with, I think, around about five of the sessions overall. Uh, with, uh, comrade Roger Silverman, uh, Ed Boba, uh, Daniel Lazar, Matthew Jones, and I'm still waiting for a reply for our guests from Italy to talk about fascism. So uh, there will be a variety of speakers and obviously, uh, you know, a variety of issues and discussions coming up. So uh, tonight's uh, session is, is called Imperialism, War and Revolution. And it's really a sort of introduction to the first 20 years or so of the 20th century, it's sort of setting the scene and particularly focuses on the First World War, or as I think it should really be called the First Imperialist War. Uh, a few years ago, uh, comrades may remember, um, we. Uh, well, some people celebrated uh, the First World War between 2014 and 2018, and there was a great deal of, you know, public attention, uh, lots of television programs, some good, some less good, and, and lots of, I suppose, uh, attention devoted to that war. But why I wanted to set situated in the context of imperialism is try to look at the importance of that war but also what it tells us about the nature of capitalist society. Uh, wars, and particularly uh, wars of the character of the First and the Second World Wars, are often portrayed as um, aberrations or, uh, in a sense, un events which uh, are unnatural. Now, of course, they are deeply unnatural. They are deeply uh, aberrant and um, you know, the horrific slaughter in those two world wars is, uh, you know, is, is clearly historically very important. But, but my argument is that those wars uh, arise out of the nature of capitalism as it, as it had developed in the 19th and the 20th centuries. And that in particular, out of a, a, a phase of capitalism, imperialist or, the, or monopoly capitalism, so, so far from being something of an aberration, something that went against the nature of capitalist society, I'm going to argue that, the, that these wars, but particularly the first, which is the one we'll consider in some way this evening, arose because of a series of contradictions in capitalism, both uh, national rivalries between the great empires, so in that sense it's a war for empire, but it's also linked to contradictions in the economic and the social system. So that far from being some sort of accident or in a sense, something that was unexpected, many people, not just Marxists, were clearly seeing that the, um, that the great power rivalries and, the, and the, the, the wars over colonies, over markets and over control of uh, the world were leading in that direction. So, I want to try and sort of set the context for that and also to try and explain why I think that this is important uh, in shaping what's going to come uh, for the rest of the century. 
T Tina was quite right when I uh, when with other comrades when we drew this sort of list up, uh, we realised that really it would probably run for the rest of the year, and indeed I'm very well aware that even in the uh, 10, 12 weeks I think that we've got, it's it's actually um, you know we're really compressing things, so um, we, we decided to do the cut off point at the Second World War, but I'm sure that uh, perhaps later in the year we'll look at the more recent developments. I thought I'd begin by trying to uh, give you something of a picture, maybe through maps, um, an old sort of teacher's habit of uh, always wanting to use maps to sort of explain things, at least a very old fashioned teacher's way of doing things. And what I want to, uh, want to do is to look at the, the world as it would have appeared in the, um, in the early, uh, nine, in the early 20th century, 1900. I'm going to start with Europe, because obviously Europe is the, the, the center of world capitalism at that point, along with the United States. Uh, the United States is a developing power, and indeed people are very well aware that its industrial and economic power is growing greatly, and indeed in many senses it's now very clearly a rival to um, the two main imperialist powers, the British Empire here, and the German Empire, slightly later empire arriving on the scene from the 1870s, but already by the beginning of the 20th century, clearly a rival to Britain. And indeed, in all sorts of ways, these will, this will be the key in imperialist rivalry, both you know, in military terms but in economic terms as well. But the other, uh, the, the other uh, states in Europe are not uh, unimportant when it comes to imperialist rivalry. France has an overseas empire, which we'll look at in a moment. And of course, we have the, the bastion of reaction over in the east, the Tsarist empire. And then two other empires who will be quite important in, in you know, contributing to these events, the Austro-Hungarian empire in uh, Central Europe, into the Balkans, and then, of course, the Ottoman Empire, which is, has been in long term historical decline in this period, but still controls a large area which is, was known as Turkey in Europe. But essentially, Kevin, can I just interrupt you quickly? Could, any chance you could zoom in a bit? It's tiny on the screen. Is it really? Um, yeah. My apologies. I'm not sure how I can do that, Tina. Um, hmm. And the view probably at the top, middle view, and then zoom in. Okay, sorry. Uh, what's happening is that the um, um, dear, I um, no, I've sort of rather lost control of it because of <laughs> the panels. Uh, okay, uh, don't worry. This is, what, this is what happens when you try to be clever, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Um, yes. Now I've now I've made it smaller. I think you have. Yes. <laughs> Excuse me. Let me. Is that sorry? Um, I shouldn't have interrupted you. Um, yeah, I, I'll, come, I'll tell you. We'll come out of it for a second. Do you know what? Shall I try and share my screen? Because you've yeah, sent me the yeah. pictures, haven't you? Yeah. Well, no. It's. I, I would prefer to. Let me just go back onto this again. I'm, I'm sorry about this. Imperialism PowerPoint. No, it's, uh, it's worse. Okay, Tina, if you could, um, there are a couple of maps which are slightly different, but we'll see. Okay. There you go. Okay, yeah. Okay. Now I've got some other problems, dear me. This is, uh, this is what happens when you try to do the technology. My screen is going uh, flickering, but I'll try and uh, I'll try and go through it. Oh, sorry. Yeah, no, it's okay. I'll, if 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 you can um, if you can work your way through it. Sure. Um, okay. So um, uh, the, the the point is that there are um, we, we have these um, we have these empires. Uh, these are world empires. They're, they're rivals. But their rival, rivalries are both uh, colonial outside of Europe and also within Europe itself. And uh, again, if, if you look at the um, if you look at the um, uh, at the map, you'll be able to see um, 
some of those rivalries, particularly uh, in the Balkans between the Austrian Empire and the Ottoman Empire, but also uh, rivalries between uh, Germany and France uh, over some disputed territory in, in Alsace-Lorraine, again, going, rivalries going back into the 19th century. And of course, the, the, the prime rivalry between Britain and the German Empire uh, on naval power, uh, there's, a, there's an arms race in the early 20th century, but also um, for colonial power, in particular, the, uh, the arguments that uh, Germany was putting forward for a place in the sun, as it were, uh, gaining colonies. Now, if we turn to the next slide, which uh, is, is on my side, it's called um, World Imperialism, and shows a map of um, the world. Um, okay, sorry, I have to do it him one by yeah. one. There you go. Can you see it? Yeah, I, I can't see it at all now, uh, Tina. But never mind. This is one of the problems of using the technology. Okay, um, just just very clearly, what you will see in that that world map is really the way that the world is dominated by European empires. The British Empire, which uh, again most of us will be aware of, covers around about a quarter of the world's uh, land surface, covers a large part of uh, of Africa, of Asia, and of course the uh, the countries which are evolving now towards uh, dominion or what will be dominion status: Canada, South Africa, Australia, New Zealand. But large large areas of the world are either under the direct control of uh, European powers, or they're certainly within the orbit of them. So that even on that map, countries uh, such as China or Persia, the modern day Iran. Uh, will in effect be within the spheres of influence of, of the imperialist powers. And of course, uh, countries which um, we don't always think of as being important imperialist powers, such as Belgium, do control quite important uh, territories in, uh, in Africa, the, the Belgium Congo, a particularly horrific instance of, um, of imperialism. And of course, uh, the, the, the French Empire in, uh, in, in West Africa. Um, which, uh, when I looked at those maps as a child, I was always incredibly impressed with because it was seemed very large. And uh, indeed, if you look at it, a great chunk of, of Africa there, although much of that is desert. But certainly, for imperialists who like to look at their um, <laughs> at their maps, it was uh, you know a very impressive, uh, very impressive site. Now, those maps, I think, explain or help us to understand the nature of some of these rivalries. But what would, would perhaps uh, clarify things is to look at the nature of imperialism, or rather to, to, to look at how some people saw imperialism in this period. And uh, what I'd like Bettina to do is to go back to the very first slide, which is called Lenin on imperialism. And um, it's also got some, it's got a, a second slide as well. Um, which follows on from that. Um, Sorry, oops. Yeah. Uh, hold on. What can possibly go wrong? Yes. Yeah, I think some things have gone wrong actually. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Is that what you mean? Yeah, here it is. Well, it is, but it looks like you, yeah, that's it. I've, I've actually got a better slide, but yeah. My apologies, comrades, for this. This is, this is what happens when I'm like near technology. Um, now, why I think it's important to clarify this point about imperialism is that, of course, imperialism or the idea of empire goes back to the classical world. So we're all aware of, um, of, of, of states that call themselves empires. We're very, very well aware of the way that colonies have developed. We know that countries conquer territories, they settle uh, in those, they exploit them. Um, that, that pattern, you know, is, is probably at least three, maybe even 4,000 years old. So what makes this phase of an imperialism different, or at least I, I think that it's different, and I'm following not only Lenin, Kautsky, 
uh, Hilferding, uh, Hobson, a whole range of people who, you know, both, both from left and, and the liberal tradition, who saw that something different was happening in the late 19th and 20th centuries with empire. And this was the idea that empire was a product of a particular stage of capitalism, what Lenin refers to as the monopoly stage. So he sees empire as developing, not as in the simple form of conquest, but actually through a much more developed system of capitalism that in particular ends uh, one phase of capitalism, replaces it with, with monopoly, and in particular, the importance of finance capital and new forms of, of ownership, but also new relationships between financial capital and industrial capital. But also that this new form of, of, of empire isn't just simply conquest for markets. It's not even, it's not conquest either simply for raw materials. It's also conquest that enables the export of capital. In other words, that capitalism is expanding beyond its home market. So you, you have international capitalist monopolies, you have international, an international form of capitalism, but it's also one which is integrated in the form of national states, which are rivals with each other, which are then enter into competition. Now, this is where the, the, the debates about imperialism uh, become interesting because many, uh, many theorists, uh, often uh, from, the, from what we would think of as the pro-capitalist wing, uh, argued that this form of uh, imperialism would actually lead to stability. It would lead, in, in Kautsky's words, to ultra-imperialism, in which the integration of economies would actually make war much less. It's a sort of very early form of the so-called McDonnell thesis, um, which sounds very grand until you realize it's just a slogan uh, developed by, the, by an American who said that no, no two countries with, with, with branches of McDonald's in them have ever gone to war with each other. Um, and that was, I suppose, the idea that capitalism, far from encouraging war and expansion, actually encourages uh, cooperation, almost a sort of economic harmony, as it were. So that, that argument of ultra-imperialism and that, that, that war, in fact, would fade and that countries, because they were so integrated with each other, it would cease to be profitable, as it were, to go to war, was one was a theory that was put around quite widely, but was, was criticised particularly by Lenin, by Bukharin and others, who argued that, in fact, capitalism had reached the stage now where war was, was inevitable. And indeed, war was a necessity in the battle between imperialist powers. So these, uh, these arguments about the nature of imperialism and about the nature of capitalism, I think are, are significant because uh, Lenin and others are theorizing as they are, they're, they're presented with uh, a particular crisis. And of course, the key crisis is the outbreak of the First World War. But before we, before we turn to that, I want also to look at perhaps another side of this, which is also important. And again, often I think is left out in many of the conventional histories. And that of course is alongside imperialist expansion and capitalist growth, you get the emergence and the development of the working class movement. And that working class movement both um, participates and benefits to a certain extent in the metropolitan countries, in, um, in, from imperialism. Uh, again, Lenin, is, Lenin develops uh, you know, a number of theories in, in, in both his book, Imperialism and Elsewhere, to, to talk about the way that the profits of imperialism uh, would filter down. He talks about the, the, the role of um, uh, the, the, a certain relatively privileged sections of the working class who could be could share in that, and he, he suggests in some ways that the, the, the role of uh, trade unions and indeed some, uh, some parties, he will go on to develop this later, uh, you know, act to facilitate that, and above all, act to incorporate the working class into, uh, into a, an imperialist system. But the other point about the domestic nature of imperialism is the relationship between finance industrial capital and the state. 
and in particular a development which really does reach um, starts to become very apparent in the first world war is of course state monopoly capitalism and the role of, of those capitalist interests and the state and indeed other parts of uh, the, uh, the military state machine really now function as interlocking, interlocking networks. So that, for example, in the German economy, you have in the, in the First World War um, so-called um, war socialism. And this is, in effect, state control of the economy uh, in order to maximize wartime production um, and you know, mobilize all the resources of the nation uh, for, for fighting that war. But also it's the, it's the role of those large, um, large companies, those large capitalist concerns, um, particularly um, in, in, in the German case, the obvious arms manufacturers, the steel manufacturers, and uh, companies like RAG, the, the general um, uh, electrical uh, company. And that, um, that pattern of uh, the penetration of, um, of, of the state uh, by capitalist interest, by military interest, is I think uh, a very significant uh, feature of this form of imperialism. So we, we have that we have that development. We also have the the, the development or the, the the role of the working class, and particularly the the challenge of the working class through uh, social democratic parties. Again, the German. The German case is the, is, is the most significant, uh, but large scale working class organizations through trade unions. Those unions in the, in the years running up to the, uh, the First World War are, are often militant. There's a wave of uh, industrial unrest as um, my, um, my old school history books called it. Uh, there's a wave of industrial unrest in, uh, in, in Britain, in France, and to a certain extent in Germany as well. And these, these forces add a domestic pressure. Several of the great powers, Britain is one of them, Germany perhaps more so, attempt to use imperialism both as a, a not only an economic uh, uh, stabilizing agent, but also a political stabilizing agent as well. And, and by that, I mean that they, they have popular imperialist campaigns in an attempt to integrate the working class. In, in the case of the, the Kaiser's Germany, so-called social imperialism, the idea that um, external politics can mobilize and rally the population behind the regime, but also to um, identify enemies within who don't buy into that uh, project. And also, um, to direct attention outward. So that, for example, there are popular campaigns around in, uh, imperialist projects. In Germany, uh, there's, a, there's an election in 1907, the so-called Hottentot election, um, which is about, um, turns around the campaign in Southwest uh, Africa, a pretty genocidal campaign uh, in, that, uh, in that territory. And that attempts to rally um, support against, um, against the social democrats drawing on patriotic imperialist themes. In Britain, in the same period, we have the, um, the, the, the campaign for uh, armaments, and in particular to expand the, the Royal Navy, very much again directed against Germany um, with rallies and, and popular mobilizations demanding increased uh, arm spending uh, and so on. So those are two examples, but of course you can see similar sorts of mobilizations around nationalistic and imperialist themes in France and uh, also to a lesser extent in Austria, Hungary as well. So imperialism then isn't just an economic system. Um, it isn't just uh, military conquest. It's also um, a political system. And as such, it, it attempts, um, as uh, governments have, all, have always done, it attempts to use foreign adventures or the, the direction or the focus on an external enemy to, to bring together um, uh, internal peace and internal harmony. 
Um, now, the outbreak of the war itself is, uh, is in many ways quite a complex uh, business. And um, I, you know, I'm loath to sort of unduly simplify it, but I will, will try to talk about the main strands. There are several different crises which interlink here. Some of them are domestic, some of them are imperial, and some of them involve national rivalries which uh, operate purely within Europe. The, the key point is that the main imperialist powers have formed systems of alliances and relationships with each other, which um, in a sense divide Europe into power blocks. Now those blocks um, often mean that stronger powers like Germany then find themselves uh, allied with slightly weaker powers. And in the case of Germany, it finds itself tied to, um, to Austria-Hungary in particular. Uh, it also has a relationship with, um, uh, with, uh, with the Ottoman Empire and also as well a relationship with Italy, although Italy stays out of the war initially and then comes in on the side of the other power bloc which centers on France, Russia, and Britain. So you've got a, a series of alliances which uh, could engage various powers in a general war, but you then have within those alliances particular points of tension so that, for example, there's a clear tension in the Balkans between uh, uh, Russia and Austria-Hungary and the Ottoman Empire, with both of them looking to expand their influence in this area. Likewise, you have the, um, have the, the, the big concerns between Britain and Germany, which I've outlined. And then of course, another rivalry between France and Germany. So you have a, a set of potential rivalries, which could, uh, could under certain circumstances, trigger uh, the outbreak of a war. Now, you often the um, the actual outbreak of war in 1914 is portrayed as um, a series of sort of unfortunate accidents that, for example, people sign alliances and then they find themselves dragged into a war, or that a series of unrelated events in different parts of Europe coincide. The assassination of Franz Ferdinand, the Archduke of Austria, in Sarajevo in June 1914, the sort of conventional trigger of the war. Now, the interesting thing for us is not, you know, the, the absolutely fine detail, uh, and I, I could go through it uh, if, um, if asked, and um, whether I could sit in the examination again, I don't know, but it's not the absolute fine detail, it's the general overlying relationships, and in particular, whether the powers themselves and indeed the, the various military and political elites and uh, believed or felt it was necessary to go to war. So it isn't, it isn't just, I think, a set of accidents, it's often a set of strategic calculations. So for example, uh, the German ruling class believed that it is necessary at some stage to go to war with Britain. Uh, they've developed a high, high seas fleet uh, with the so with the so-called floating polity, and in particular, they have a, a strategic theory that 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 fleet can take on the British Navy in the North Sea, and then will be in a position to inflict a strategic defeat on Britain, and then come to terms with Britain. Likewise, they have a fear that uh, in the event of a general war that the, the Russian army, which is very big, very large army or potentially very large, but is fairly inefficient and probably couldn't get its act together to fight a war very quickly, that they will then need to launch a series of surprise attacks uh, in order to you know, gain another strategic advantage uh, very quickly. So th there, are plenty, there are plenty of arguments for a quick war uh, there's also a sense that war is coming, that the rivalries between them are important and that, you know, they cannot be resolved without some sort of fundamental conflict. And most of the, um, most of the military theorists believe that those wars will be very quick, 
the, the wars of the late 19th century, the ones involving Prussia in particular, were quite quick, they are only a matter of weeks. But um, a better example might be the American Civil War, <coughs> pardon me, the American Civil War, which not only lasted uh, four years or so, but also towards its latter stages in the, in the siege around Richmond and in that part of Virginia, had a form of trench warfare and indeed was, um, could show you what would happen in modern war of that era if you didn't make your strategic advantage count, count then you'd be very quickly bogged down, which is essentially what happened on the, on the Western Front uh, in, um, in 1914. Now, the other, the other sets of tensions are not just uh, national uh, rivalries, but also uh, the rivalries within smaller nations themselves, and particularly the tensions within states with uh, the, the larger empires, particularly the Austrian Empire, which has many national movements inside it. And of course, within the wider Balkans, demands for national liberation, national self-determination. So in a way, Europe is something of a, of a powder keg, both this great power rivalry, but also these, uh, these small approximate causes. And of course, what, what, the, what the, str the strategists have to work out is whether they should go to war now or leave it till later, but also what sort of advantages they could gain and whether it is in a, in a sense in their interests. So, the, the, the unfolding of events in 1914 is, is in many ways quite chaotic, but in other ways follows quite a recognizable pattern. Uh, the German historian Fritz Fischer, who um, looked at the, um, some of the documents from the Imperial General Staff, found a number of them which laid out fairly clearly uh, a possible timetable for war, not uh, I mean, there are some arguments that this may well have been calculated, but in particular, uh, you know, rather like a, a chess player or, or anybody else who follows uh, any sort of regular patterns and strategies, a series of predictions of, that if A did this, then B would do that, followed by C. Um, and so, in a way, when the crisis, when the, when the crisis broke out in the summer of 1914, the, uh, the, the, the strategist argued that it was better now to do this, particularly in, in the case of Germany, which was afraid of fighting a war on two fronts, but also in the case of Britain, who um, ostensibly went to war to uphold the 1839 Treaty of London and the neutrality of Belgium, but in a sense saw this as the opportunity. Indeed, was slightly fearful that if, if Germany permanently occupied um, Belgium, then that would give uh, Germany a strategic advantage in a, an area very close to Britain. Likewise, the, the, the Austrians believed that this was a good chance to deal with uh, a, a, a persistent problem uh, in, uh, in the Balkans in the form of Serbia, and it would be a chance to crush Serbia and deal with unrest within their own empire. In the words of the um, in the words of the uh, uh, Austro-Hungarian uh, chief of staff, Konrad von Herzendorf, this would be a preventive war. And uh, he also argued, as did the Kaiser as well, that this would be a good chance to sort of rally the population around war and, um, uh, uh, and deal with their internal opposition. So there are a number of factors here, as well as the overriding uh, you know, problems of imperialism and of economic rivalry that we've talked about. Um, I've left out the United States, not because the United States is unimportant. I mean, it is very important. It does become involved in the war after 1917. But the United States was still a developing power, although it had imperialist ambitions of its own. And indeed, in the, the, uh, the American-Spanish War of 1896, it had gained colonies in, in Cuba in the Philippines, and was also expanding uh, into parts of um, uh, the Pacific, as well as having, in a sense, a sphere of influence, which, which it had had uh, fairly consistently throughout much of the late 19th century in, in Latin America. But the United States 
world war was still only evolving at this point. And of course, it will be the First World War. In which it will be in the years after the First World War when that, that world war really comes into its own. In a sense, it will, um, as is going to be the case in the Second World War, rather like um, Fortin Brass at the end of Hamlet, he, they will come onto the stage when all the bodies are there and in a sense uh, start to impose their position. But so the United States, his role is, is significant, but in the immediate outbreak of the war, uh, much less so. Now, um, I don't know if Tina can get uh, another slide up if we've got there, but um, there's a slide which shows um, the, the figures of uh, involvement in the First World War, particularly casualty figures uh, and numbers of troops. Again, I'm, I'm at a disadvantage here because I can't really see it, so I'm going to have to try and do it from memory. But if you just look, you'll see that the, the, the First World War involves millions of people throughout Europe. It involves um, really a mass mobilization of the population. And it is, of course, um, what, what will in the Second World War be called a total war, but it's the first war in which uh, large numbers of civilians are drafted into the army. Germany has a cons conscription system. Britain's uh, system is voluntary, although it will, will move on to conscription from 1916. But I want to look at the numbers of, uh, of people involved look at the numbers uh, killed running into, uh, into the millions, but also look at the casualties. Casualties doesn't mean death, it means uh, injuries uh, and, um, and also, you know, in, um, in other words, it, it's really talking about how badly affected people are. And look at the large numbers of uh, people who were mobilized into the armies who are casualties in that way. Um, again quite high in countries like France and, uh, and Russia but much less so in the British Empire. Um, it is a world war. Uh, in Britain we tend to focus on the western uh, the western front we, uh, we but in fact the war does go on um, and um, it involves uh, the eastern front and of course, it's fought globally. Um, there are uh, battles in Africa. Uh, there are there's some fighting in Asia. There's of course fighting um, in the um, in the Middle East with the uh, so-called Arab Revolt, um, and British troops are involved in that. They have, in fact, one of their most uh, significant defeats in Mesopotamia uh, there. Um, and of course, there are naval battles. There's the, the uh, uh, submarine warfare, the U-boat campaign, and then the, the Allied blockade of Germany, which again has uh, very serious effects on the, uh, on the population, starvation, and indeed malnutrition quite widespread. So this is a, a war which uh, is in a sense the first modern war and uh, it involves uh, large numbers of people, both as um, workers, but also as, as soldiers. The, the horrors of that war, I think, don't, you know, don't really need to be stressed. I think we know uh, what a horrific war this was. Also, in many ways, what a perhaps an unexpected war. Although people had been um, predicting uh, the emergence of a war. Wars have, you know, take often unpredictable forms. And in that old cliche about generals fighting the last war, um, they didn't expect uh, to fight a war over a number of years. Again, the other old cliche that it would all be over by Christmas. Um, the experience of 19th century wars was a very, a, of a quick, rapid attack. One power having strategic advantage and then uh, winning the war in, and then imposing a peace, uh, you know, in that sense, back to normal. But of course, the other things that wars do is to transform not only the lives of people as soldiers, but also as workers, and also to transform the, the role of government and the state. And I've already referred to that pattern 
uh, particularly noticeable in Germany, but also in Britain, of, of sort of a form of war socialism. And in particular, the controls over the economy for armaments production, for um, uh, rationing, the intervention of the state in everyday life. And also the impact that this has on the living standards and the conditions of, of workers. So that in the, in the main uh, imperialist countries, there are movements uh, in opposition to the war, trade union, trade unionists, for example, are trying to maintain living standards, uh, maintain wages and conditions. There are struggles over rents, you know, most famously in, um, in Glasgow. Um, there are, uh, you know, demands of, of, by workers increasingly to end the war, political demands. So the war has a, a major impact on the home front. And it's this, I think, where the, the, the point about revolution it becomes so significant. We know that historically wars created revolutions. We know that they, they speed up historical events. We know that they accelerate processes. And certainly this is very true for what will happen at the end of the, uh, end of the First World War. Because what ends the First World War is not, is not essentially the defeat of uh, one of the powers or the group of powers by conventional means. It's actually uh, the revolution. It's the Russian Revolution in 1917. It's the German Revolution of 1918. And it's the war weariness and the opposition of the working class that puts a stop to that war. The war, the, the regimes that are fighting the war disintegrate and they disintegrate fairly rapidly in, in 1918, particularly in Central Europe, but also in Germany as well. Russia, of course, has already um, has already left the war, left the war in, well, formally in March 1918, um, but had already been in a very weakened, uh, weakened state. So the war itself speeds up a number of processes. It speeds up uh, economic and social developments, and it produces really a, a, ch a challenge to capitalism. Now, We've looked, or we will look at this in some of the uh, some of the sessions about what happened to the labour movement and their reaction to the war. And I want to just sort of talk a little bit about that before concluding, because of course the the alongside the growth of um, alongside the growth of the working class was the growth of the labour movement, and in in the years leading up to. Um, 1914, it had uh, workers, workers organizations had discussed the possibilities of war and how they should react. And again, many comrades will know that the Second International took a, took a position of, uh, of opposition to war and to militarism, but the, and, 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 and said that in the event of a war, it would uh, it call a general strike, it would stop the, the mobilization process it would argue that workers have no interest in fighting their fellow workers from another state. Now, of course, we also know that that didn't happen and that the working class movement, um, leaders of the working class movement in particular, sided with their own imperialists and, and, and in a sense joined in the war effort. In fact, more than joined in the war effort in many countries, uh, labor leaders, socialists went into the cabinet and gave um, all forms of support uh, for, um, for the war effort. The so-called uh, civil peace war, freedom in Germany was an example of that. But also in Britain, uh, Labour went into government as a part of the coalition government for the first time. So the war sees both uh, the working class drawn working class organizations drawn in to the um, drawn into the war effort as indeed many of the labor leaders had been before the war um, so they're drawn into the war effort but the war itself does lead to considerable uh, opposition and that opposition takes many forms it leads to the growth of left left currents in the socialist movement 
And of course, following the Russian Revolution, it will also lead to the creation of, of, of communist parties and movements that want to follow the Soviet example. So the war itself is in many ways, um, you know, a turning point. It's, uh, it's, it's the beginnings, I think, of, uh, in, in many ways, real 20th century history. But it also lays down, you know, uh, a tremendous number of patterns and forms that are going to continue. And um, if we can just uh, turn to the last two slides, which are or the, the last three, uh, one which shows the map of Europe in 1920. Yeah. Now, uh, again, it's it's just shows the you know how the First World War transforms. Um, no, I, I, sorry, it's um, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's okay. I'm I it, I can see it now. Yeah, it shows the way that the old empires are dismembered. So, for example, um, we have uh, the creation of a whole series of new states in Eastern Europe. We have the loss of Germany loses territory. And of course, we have the breakup of the Ottoman Empire and uh, above all, the creation of the Soviet Union. Um, the, um, the other development is which will occur in um, 1922 is the uh, is the partition of Ireland and the creation of the Irish Free State. Um, there are a number of other developments as well, but you can see clearly that that map is a very different map from the one that, um, that we had at the beginning of the, uh, of the century. But the interesting one is the one of, uh, of, of world imperialism, which I'm not sure whether we've got that one on there. Um, and that shows a redivision of the world um, into new uh, imperialist blocks. The empires are actually strengthened uh, as a result of the war. Germany loses its colonies. Um, those colonies are, um, are given largely to Britain uh, in East Africa. Uh, the, the French get some as well. Uh, there we are. Yes, it's, it's just on there now. But also, if we look at the Middle East, territories that were controlled by the Ottoman Empire are now under the control of the British and the French. So imperialism does appear superficially to have been strengthened so that uh, the, the old spheres of influence remain, but the, the empires actually grow bigger. The British Empire, for example, is at, is at its greatest extent uh, in, in these years in the 1920s, probably about 22, I think. Um, it, it's probably at its, its greatest extent. So the, the victorious powers have gained colonies and have gained some, uh, gained some further territorial influence, but they've also been bled dry. And in particular, the amounts of money that they've had to borrow uh, from the United States um, has in a sense weakened them, and indeed this will have uh, this will have re uh, um, repercussions later on because the the French and the British are so determined to sort of recoup their losses that they impose a fairly punitive uh, uh, settlement on Germany, uh, reparations payments, and so on, and indeed much of the cr economic crisis that will um, assist the rise of the Nazis. Will be, will be based upon the demands of uh, the, the Allies for reparations. And so we can see that the balance is already starting to tilt, that the United States is in a sense the, you know, the real winner, that Britain and France have really sort of bled themselves dry fighting that war. And although they have had a Philip, uh, a, a, a post-war Philip with the, with the new territories, that their resources, and the, the debts that they built up to fight the war have really imposed burdens on them. But I think there's also something else that's going to emerge later on, and that is partly the, the, through the influence of the revolution the, that creates the Soviet Union, but also in many ways that the, the prestige of empire and the sense that empires were all powerful is really challenged 
in the period 1914 to 18. And it's in this period that we start to see the, the, you know, the consolidations of movements of independence in the colonial countries. This is certainly the case in India, and it's uh, obviously, uh, we've mentioned Ireland, but also in, in other areas, the example of, uh, of national independence movements, and above all, the, the, um, the sort of fragility of that imperialist system will encourage many people now in the colonies to begin uh, campaigns for independence. So ostensibly, uh, the world order is, is restored, but of course there are new dynamics in that order. The Soviet Union brings a new challenger. It shows that there is an alternative to capitalism, but also the empires are under challenge from, from their subjects and from their peoples demanding independence. So in 1918, it looks as if the, the old order has been restored, but as we will discover in the sessions to come, it's actually far from restored. And indeed, it just opens up further revolutionary uh, periods and also in reaction, further counter-revolutionary periods as well. But I will, um, I will stop there. I've gone on a bit longer than I intended. My apologies for um, the problems with the slides. I'm unable to really to see things and I can't see the chat or the question. So if, if Tina could read them out to me, then I'll respond. Okay, thanks. Will do. Thank you very much, Kevin. That was uh, as fascinating as we uh, hoped it would be, no doubt. Um, I was going to say a, a few things. Um, it's quite interesting, ultra-imperialism developed by, by, by Kautsky, Karl Kautsky. Uh, he actually developed that in 1914. <laughs> he put that out, that there won't be a world war because, you know, ultra-imperialism. It's ultra-nonsense, as it turned out. But, uh, you know, you could say, oh, okay, nobody knew at the time and stuff, but actually Rosa Luxemburg and Karl Liebknecht um, were very, very busy trying to get the Second International to uh, stick to its guns and as well, not its guns, but it's, uh, you know, peace, <laughs> the, the outlook for peace and not support war efforts, etc. But they already, um, there's a really good film by Margaret Margarete von Trott uh, about Rosa Luxemburg and I recommend comrades watch this because it goes into some details, it's, it's length, but it goes into some details of especially Rosa Luxemburg going to these congresses long before the war and trying to make sure comrades that war is coming, you, we really have to be careful and we really have to be sure that we stick to internationalism and not get drawn into it. And even then you could see uh, she was booed down and people were slow clapping her and stuff. It's fasc fascinating to, to watch that. So, um, you know, some people did see it coming quite, quite dramatically. Um, but of course that, that finished off the second international, the war, because as, as, as uh, Kevin explains, um, the working classes or the established left, you know, the labor parties, the social democratic parties, they all moved to the right or moved behind their, their national bourgeoisie in the name of you know, saving their own country, et cetera, supporting the war. Um, you know, could be hoped we, we learned something from that, but I'm not 100% sure. It's an interesting um, dilemma, isn't it? That war creates revolution, but it also fucks up a lot of things, doesn't it? Not only does it kill a lot of people, but it's, uh, you know, it is, not necessarily perhaps the case that war breeds revolution otherwise we would you know be hoping for a lot of war but it of course it does it did happen in 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 in, in 1918 uh, not just russia and, and germany but also bulgaria and, and and as kevin says mutinies were rife you know this because this this wasn't it couldn't it could, couldn't come to a proper ending without you know it was the working class taking a charge because they would have carried on and on and on and on, um, and a, a, again, it's, it's quite a interesting in, in the in the film about Rosa Luxemburg about how how um, people refused, you know, soldiers refused to carry out the orders of their their generals who basically knew they're sending them on on suicide mission. They just said, no, enough, we're not doing this anymore. We'll kill you instead if you want us <laughs> to to go and kill ourselves. So it's a very good film. Um, okay, um, I've got one question in the Q&A from John Beeching. 
Do you think that the support for national self-determination was a mistake and that it encouraged the support for nationalism in the countries of Europe and thereby destroyed international solidarity? <laughs> okay, uh, Mike Kennard. Yeah, <clears throat> I'm on, right. Just, a, I'm just going to be sort of jumping ahead into the sort of the future. Um, so, but I want to talk about a little bit about the role of Japan because um, the, the Russian Japanese uh, War of 1903 uh, to 1905, which uh, uh, undermined Tsarism and led to the 1905 uh, aborted re revolution, um, but it left Japan uh, in control of uh, Korea mm. and of, uh, of Taiwan. And they've also got a foothold on uh, on uh, mainland uh, mainland China. Um, and I, I think that you know, if, if going back to that um, chart you showed of uh, of the casualties, um, Japan got out of that very very lightly indeed, mm. um, and actually managed to uh, because they were in a, um, a process of modernisation and industrialisation. And it was a it was a terrific um, it was a terrific bullet for, uh, for for the for the Japanese and so the uh, so the seeds and just as the um, demand for reparations uh, by uh, by France and uh, and Britain um, so the seeds of uh, the Second World War in uh, in Europe the um, uh, the role of Japan and the expansion of Japan. Um, in the period of, sort of from 1900 to about 19, uh, 1925, 1930, actually sowed the seeds of the uh, the future war in uh, in the Pacific. Mm. Mike, thanks, Mike. Uh, Matthew, please. Come on, yeah, a few things. Uh, the um, well, apart from anything else, if people haven't seen the uh, the two guys who were detained by the um, immigration. Um, detention mob from the Home Office this morning, just after nine o'clock, were let out of the van just before six this evening, which is a great victory achieved by the masses of, uh, of this city uh, mm -hmm. to allow the, the Home Office to uh, carry out deportations, etc., etc. So yes, um, I, I put up some video on the on the WhatsApp. So it's a great, great thing. You know, been watching it all day. Um, so I think that I mean, there's various things in there. I mean, I think the there's a few bits which are, I think, you know, in terms of the US, if you look at the US, actually, the most important war in US history, and the word, one of the worst casualties is the US Civil War, actually, in which there's three, three quarters of a million, I think the latest estimates are three quarters of a million dead, which is phenomenal for the size of the country it was, you know, it was an absolute devastation. Um, and, and something really which the, affected the US very deeply ever since, uh, in terms of the, you know, the, the, that, you know, and certainly um, marked, you know, really the, the reluctance of the US to get involved in the First World War, having, having been involved in the in the Civil War and the effect of that on the, on the, on the population. Um, very strong. Um, I think uh, in, in, the interesting thing really is in terms of, 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 of that also is, of course, as, as, as Tina says, in terms of the, of the Second International uh, and the debates that happen, and the Second International actually passes a resolution saying they're against the war. You know, um, you know, Rose Luxembourg succeeds and and and, and then passes this resolution that they're against the war. Um, but of course, then of course, when it comes down to the point, the whole thing breaks down, and they actually vote for for for, for war credits. And but it but it does actually what it does do, of course, is to split most of the parties. I mean, it splits obviously the, the SPD, it splits the Labour Party. Um, it splits the Russian parties, which are technically, of course, it's all still the Russian Social Democratic Labour Party, it's all still technically the same organisation, but of course it splits pro anti war at the point in 1914. The thing is, of course, that you know, while you say, okay, you know, revolutions happen at the end, of course, there's then this effort to, to, to create this, this you know, anti war organisation, um, which, is, which is tiny. I mean, was it the. Um, um, the, the, the meeting they held in Switzerland, and right? I'll remember it in a minute. Uh, the, the, the Kinderwald. Kinderwald, yes. Uh, they said, well, they can accommodate the whole of the, 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 the anti-war international in one railway carriage, you know? 
the whole the leaders of the committee accommodated in, in one railway carriage. And of course, I mean, you know, actually, of course, then of course there was a split in, in, in that group between those who were actually actually pacifists and those who were saying, okay, well, we should take the, 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 the war to the ruling class. Um, you know, the line of, of, of Lenin and Trotsky and, and, and others. Um, you know, obviously there was, you know, this whole whole business, you know, in terms of a, of, of, of a, of a line. Um, I think, you know, also you say about, you talk about empires. I mean, the thing was, of course, that what happened obviously was that, I mean, the thing starts to peel apart because obviously it disintegrates in terms of, you know, the, 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 lack, of, the lack of money and the fact that, the, the, you, know, the, you know, the British basically deed themselves by as as they, as as did the French even worse so and of course actually the French are the, are the biggest investors in Russia and they lose a lot you know so essentially it takes out France as a world power because it just loses huge amounts of of, of its actual in, investments on in in, in in Russia because obviously the Bolsheviks turn around so you you've got no chance of getting any of that um, you know that then that's the end of that and so but the thing is that the, the, the empire itself then of course. The, the, the center starts to become dependent on the provinces, particularly India. And actually it's the Indians, it's New Delhi that invades the Middle East against the wishes, in fact, in many cases. Of, the, 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 I, don't think, I don't think London really wanted to, have, to, to control Iraq, but the, 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 the Indian army marched into the place and they're like, okay, we'll, we'll take the place. You know, and it winds up with this whole whole issue in terms of well, how are you going to hold it then? We haven't got enough people to hold it because it's big revolt, and like, okay, as you would as you might expect. So the thing actually starts to 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 to, to disintegrate. Um, a process which we're also seeing at this point as well. And I think that you know, I mean, it's it, 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 it's then of course the whole sort of it's the political questions that are, that are raised uh, and and work their way through. Uh, and, and the fact that there's a sort of shattering effect on that second international, which never, never, is never really, never really recovers. Um, you know, uh, uh, actually, of course, if you look at it, you know, the, the whole business of, 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 of really of reformism and the Labour Party and all these other organisations actually become dependent in many ways upon the existence of Stalinism and not. And, and we can see now, I mean, you can see quite clearly, you know, that, that, that basically they want to revolt, rev, to, to be sort of standard issue um, capitalist politicians if possibly, if they possibly can get rid of any of this sort of notion of having anything to do with, lab, with labour movements or any of this sort of thing. Um, that, 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 you know, and that's clear. Um, but it just takes a, takes a while for these things to, to, to work their way through. But that, that, that is the impact, of, that is Blair. You know, obviously coming relatively soon after the disintegrations, final disintegration of and you get Blair saying, okay, well, you know, we'll just, we'll not bother with any of the slave movements that can just become a standard issue. Uh, you know, slightly more liberal capital, capitalist politicians. Uh, and and that, 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 that goes for most of the rest of it as well. So there's a whole sort of series of quite long-term, as you say, quite long-term political impacts, um, you know, in, in, in terms of the effect of that, of that war. Um, and also, as you say, the rise of the US, which, which, which emerges, emerges relatively intact out of the thing and, and, and then has to spend its time basically financing um, everybody else for, at cost. Obviously, they, they, they extract the cost from, 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 from uh, all, all the other players. Um, they're not stupid. So it, 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 it changes everything in many, in, in many ways. Thanks. Thanks, Matthew. Um, I've shared your video on the LLA Facebook page now. It is brilliant. Comrades, I have no other people indicating. Are there any others who want to ask questions or make uh, contributions? I'm going to bring in Kevin now anyway, so you can think about it. Okay, thanks. And uh, yes, I join in the, uh, the general celebration. Um, I mentioned Glasgow with the uh, housing strikes and it was very much in my mind, uh, Matthew. So um, that's why I did the plug for Glasgow. Um, I just want to uh, sort of respond to John's point about national self-determination because um, what's interesting about that demand is that it becomes quite general in, um, uh, in world politics 
during the First World War. And that's in a response to the Bolsheviks uh, raising the demand, particularly inside the uh, what would have been the Tsarist Empire, which, um, you know, is, and again, in the old phrase was the prison house of nationalities. And uh, President Wilson, who um, formulated a post-war strategy, which he was quite successful in imposing in the Versailles and the other settlements, Treaty of Lausanne and, and so on, um, took that argument of self-determination and applied it uh, to the dismemberment of certain empires, but of course not to others. Um, but it was interesting that um, when, when the empires were reconfigured, the British Empire and the French and so on, that the, the areas they were given were given as mandates rather than as direct possessions so that even, even, even then the impact of the demand for self-determination had undermined some aspects of uh, you know, imperialism as a political force. So I think, that, uh, I, I think that Lenin's support for that idea is, is important and uh, it does have a clear political impact. Your point though about whether it um, uh, is an obstacle and indeed whether it creates more nationalisms is I suppose very relevant for us today in relation to Scotland. And um, I think again, there are different views amongst comrades which echo some of the splits in the international socialist movement. And um, uh, Tina refers there to Rosa Luxemburg and in particular um, her contribution to German social democracy but in the years um, before, um, well, be, even before she came to Germany, but even when she was active in Germany, she took an interest in events in Poland and Lithuania, where she was, was born and where she was from. And her arguments in opposition to the, uh, to the national movement and indeed to the idea of national self-determination put forward the arguments that, that these were either distractions or even worse, were presented, pre presenting roadblocks to socialism, that, that national divisions and that workers divided uh, on national lines would, uh, would, would, would hold up the struggle for socialism. So there is a, there is a long tradition indeed going back even further uh, into the 19th century, similar debates. Now the, arg the argument I think that Lenin and others put forward was that if you as a, as a socialist or as a, a socialist movement, you opposed national self-determination, you would then in a sense side with the oppressors and leaving aside, well, leaving aside that even on just on the most basic tactical grounds that if you side with the oppressors and you try to appeal to the, to the, to the oppressed workers of the oppressed nation, then you're not likely to get a very good or very clear hearing. So his argument was that, that national self-determination and democratic demands would, you know, would be acceded to, that, that people, people could have those rights, should have those rights when they clearly wanted them. But socialists should argue for the, 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 the largest uh, political and organizational unity so that the, you could argue for a voluntary federation of peoples rather than simply having separate na national states. But you wouldn't, you certainly wouldn't, or his argument was that you certainly shouldn't um, be opposed to people exercising that right. But it was necessary uh, in a way to build confidence, to build relationships between workers in, of the oppressing nationality and the oppressed nationality. Whether, whether that had that impact, I, um, I mean, you know, you, you, you perhaps question that, John, in your question. My argument would be that, uh, that the experience of, of nationalist movements in, say, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, that, um, that, any, it, that if socialists had opposed that, then that clearly would have been very counter-revolutionary. I think actually, far from supporting the rise of socialism would only have strengthened those forms of nationalism. But it, is a, it was an important debate and the fact the way that Wilson took, took it up 
as a counter to Bolshevik demands, particularly in relation to the empires, I think shows the, the power of that. Uh, Mike, your, your point about Japan was, uh, was well made, and uh, I should have pointed out on the, on the last map of 1920 the way that um, the, the Japanese gained territory in, you know, in, as you say, Formosa or Taiwan and the Korean Peninsula and, and that area of northern, um, northern China. Japan was a, an ally of, of Britain's. In fact, it was uh, the Japanese are one of the, and Britain were allied in 1902. And um, the, uh, the modernization process that you describe is in many ways similar to the type of rise of Germany as, a, as an imperialist power in, uh, in, in Europe and indeed further afield. And of course, the, um, the acceleration of, uh, of Japanese modernization and military power by the First World War will be important, and particularly their expansion into the, into the Pacific and into Asia. Um, so, yeah, and, and, and it is an important point, I think, to note the way that the war changes a, a, a number of relationships other than just in, um, just in Europe. Um, on, uh, on your point, Matthew, about the United States, I mean, I, I, I did stress the way the United States gained from the war, and I did stress its economic role. Um, I, I think your point about the Civil War is an interesting one, particularly about what you might think of as the political reluctance to be, to be involved in long drawn out wars. Um, and of course, the United States did enter at a decisive stage, and um, it, when it did so, it, it uh, was able to, um, you know, bring lots of men and materiel into the uh, into the struggle, and you know, in many ways, tip the balance, um, certainly in a military sense. But it's also, I think, an important point about the. Um, it shows, in a way, the instabilities of imperialism that um, the idea of imperialism having a sort of self-regulating dynamic, almost that um, the world is divided up into these power blocks and that the, these great power blocks can decide the future of the world, I think is disproved very much by these events and by the emergence of the United States. Indeed, um, there, were, there were similar arguments in, among sections of uh, the British Conservatives, uh, Joseph Chamberlain in particular, who argued that, um, that, that the three great powers uh, at the end of the 19th century, America, Britain and Germany, could in a sense partition the world between them and that they'd all have spheres of influence and that this would be a sort of self-regulating system. Um, it's very much like those sort of board games that you have where you, you take the side of a great power and um, you, know, you, you, you act it out. I think it was um, risk or something like that. And of course, this wasn't a board game. This was uh, you know, a, a, a real idea, or at least it, it was an idea that was floated. But of course, that's impossible because capitalism is dynamic. It does seek out further markets. It does seek out further opportunities. And in that, there is an, an, an instability. It is far, from, far from there being equilibrium, there's constant instability and constant conflict built into it. So it means that, uh, that in a sense, the, the, the great powers can't uh, rest on their laurels and you know, must always struggle against each other. But I, I think as well that the United States was in a sense, you know, in a very fortunate position of having what was in a sense a continent rather than a, a nation. It was, it was, it was a, a great empire in and of itself before ever it expanded overseas. And so its imperialism could take a very different form. It, um, it relied much more on its financial power, but it was still imperialistic. It may not have places around the world with an American flag, but it clearly exerts political and, and economic influence in that way. And of course, we're now in the position of the United States being the, the dominant world power, the hegemon, but it too is facing challenges. And again, uh, the United States 
if you uh, read um, some of its commentators, some of its military and political leaders, they too talk about this problem of decline. And it's interesting that um, it's often sort of seen almost as a sort of inevitable life cycle that empires sort of come into existence and then they fade away. You know, you know the, the poem by Shelley about Ozymandias, you know, look upon, look upon my wonders and, um, you know, the way that what was once uh, imperial glory will, will inevitably fade. Now, of course, that's an interesting question for the future, particularly with the rise of China and, you know, the United States relative decline. And so in discussing imperialism in this period, you know, it does have some quite important, um, you know, lessons for us today and how we might understand the world and in that way. Um, one, one last point about the relationship between revolution and war. And um, it is, I suppose, part of a, a way of seeing the world. Um, and it was actually um, a point that I think it was Dave Hill made in one of the chats uh, um, in reference to the events in Glasgow. And one comrade said that this was a magic moment. I think it was Stan Keeble said it was a magic moment, as indeed it was. But Dave also made the very important point that, that actions like that rest on organization. And indeed, I would think a long period of campaigning and preparation. Um, now, why I bring this point in uh, to compare the, you know, the, the very effective and very good action of comrades in Glasgow to stop the Home Office enforcement team is, of course, that the, is that the revolutionary movements that arise at the end of the First World War don't, in a sense, just come from nowhere. They come from some political preparation in the sense of the experience of the working class movement and of the militant Marxist sections of it in particular, going back into the 19th century. So although there are, there are these great accelerations and these great changes, they are also based upon a degree of preparation and consolidation of a development of particularly of parties and ideas of parties, indeed of, of working class organization. And if we look at all of the, the revolutionary movements, even those movements which are not as successful as others, they still rest upon that, that sort of pattern and that sort of development. So I think the, the, the relationship between war and revolution is quite complex. And we know that in many circumstances, wars give rise to revolutionary situations. But unless there are, are parties and indeed wider movements and wider preparations for uh, taking power in those societies, then those revolutions can often dissipate or indeed even worse, uh, be drowned in the blood of a counter revolution. That's even before we, we talk about the, the role of uh, many social democratic and labor leaders, particularly in Germany, in not only um, standing idly by, but actively encouraging and working with the counter revolution. So the relationship between war and revolution is an important one, but I don't think it's automatic. And indeed, we've got plenty of examples where that you know, isn't, uh, isn't the case. So anyway, that's my, uh, my response to that, that round of questions anyway. Thank you very much, Kevin. Uh, we've got no other comments or questions. Um, so unless you have anything else to say. Uh, no, I think I'll just make a very uh, brief sort of summing up. First of all, my apologies, comrades, I've had these technical problems and um, uh, even now I can't really see the screen. So uh, some of the points I wanted to make in relation to the stats and so on, the details, um, you know, have rather gone. Um, I, I, this is an introduction and the big revolutions and counter revolutions will be coming up. So I was really sort of clearing the, uh, the stage as it were. And in particular, um, I'd like to also stress um, maybe this, um, uh, maybe Tina can put it up on one of the sites. I've also put down some reading that comrades may find useful. It's actually the last slide there. And um, the, the first three um, clips are from um, the Marxist Internet Archive. 
and their uh, Lenin's imperialism, uh, which is well worth reading. Uh, also Nikolai Bukharin's uh, work on imperialism, which was, I think, quite influential in areas, um, um, uh, quite influential in influencing Lenin's work. And I've also, for, because it's referred to uh, by um, Lenin, um, I've also included um, uh, Kautsky's uh, uh, work on ultra imperialism as well, which you might find useful. There's countless work on, um, on imperialism, on the First World War, and really I could have given you a reading list of hundreds of books, but I've just selected a few books there. Um, two, by Eric, two by Eric Hobsbawm, which um, there are things which I wouldn't agree with it, but I think are worth reading. The Age of uh, Capital and the Age of Empire, and also the, uh, his account of what he calls the short 20th century and the impact of the First World War. And then two books by uh, two different left-wing groups. Again, there would be areas I wouldn't agree with, but well worth reading. Uh, Chris Harmon's A People's History of the World, so there's a lot in that one. And then Alan Wood's uh, a pamphlet uh, on the, um, the, the First World War and the Great Slaughter. And uh, again, some, you know, some interesting points in there. But there's, there's quite a lot that, that comrades can read. Um, so I'll, I'll just make those suggestions. So uh, thank the comrades for their questions and uh, contributions. And uh, I'll, uh, I'll look forward to seeing you again uh, in actually in a couple of weeks now because other comrades will be dealing with, um, with the Russian Revolution, which obviously is going to be a, an important uh, aspect of, uh, of the, uh, the programme. So thanks very much. And once again, my apologies for the technical problems. Excellent. Thank you very much, Kevin. Who's speaking next week then on the Russian Revolution? Uh, it's Matthew. Matthew Jones. Looking forward to it. Thank you, Matthew. Uh, thank you, Matthew. Thank you, Kevin. That was a great introduction into the new series. Um, I will put those uh, reading recommendations up online now. Uh, thank you very much for attending, comrades. Make sure to come next week. Have a good evening. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.